Hello to all of you Mid-American Gardeners. Thank you for joining us. We're happy to be with you and we're gonna talk plants, plants, plants today. My name is Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department. So if you have questions about perennials, maybe cut flowers, I will maybe take those questions. But we have a lot of very talented folks here with me. And so let's find out who's here and they're going to give their expertise as well as do a show and tell or maybe an email. I'm gonna start first with you, Kent Miles. Take it away. Thanks, Diane. Uh, my name is Kent Miles. I'm a uh, associated owner of uh, Illinois Willows. We're a specially cut flower grower out in the uh, western part of Champaign County. Um, I brought a couple show and tells. The first one is one of our varieties of pussy willow that we're harvesting at the present time. And this variety is called Purple Heirloom. It has the purple bark with the purple hue of the mini catkins. And uh, this started blooming uh, about the second week of January. And we'll have it for another, uh, probably about another month, this particular one. Uh, we do nine varieties of willows, and this is one of our winter crops. Wow, it's beautiful, and it's a finer texture. Mm -hmm. I really love it's that It's got texture. that real wispy look to it. It is beautiful. Well, good. Thank you very much for bringing that. Well, let's send it on over to you, Marianne Metz. Hello, Diane. I am Marianne Metz. I'm a horticulturalist, a landscape designer, and a gardener. And today in my garden, I was pruning and happened to notice um, just an awful lot of plants that I thought were really special. And I've, I've brought a bouquet of the color and texture you can have in your winter garden. This time of year, we usually think about things that, you know, we, we want flowers and all sorts of things to look at, but there's a lot of color in your garden. And many, many evergreens and um, a broadleaf evergreen. I just am really tickled with that. Japanese maples, a lot of you know, I, I collect Japanese maples. There's always um, color in the bark of the maples. I love that. And I even have a um, Dawn Redwood. Some of the uh, really interesting stems from that, which just wonderful texture. And not that necessarily want to have a bouquet of any of these, but I just think it's it's nice to have this kind of variety of, of materials in your garden in the winter time to look at. So it's, um, I think, really interesting time of year, unlike the flowers we have in the summer. Well, it's when you really see blue-green versus green, versus yellow green. I think you really can pick up all those different shades and oh, tints. Totally. I love, just absolutely love this Camisipras um, that has the yellow mm -hmm. yellow coloration. It's probably a eight between an eight and ten foot tall tree, uh, six feet, seven feet wide at the base. Really beautiful and it's just bright screaming yellow. It's a nice screaming. Did yeah. you say screaming, screaming yellow? yellow. <laughs> it's a nice highlight. That's very pretty. Thanks, Marianne. Mm -hmm. Well, next we're going to go to, sh to you, Shane Cultra. Hi, I'm Shane Cultra. I'm one of the owners of Country Arbors Nursery in Urbana, Illinois, and Culture Nurseries in Onarga, Illinois. And as the owner, I get to touch a little bit of everything, from shrubs to trees to landscaping. I even clean the bathroom. So uh, <laughs> I can answer pretty much any questions as far as the greens. Uh, my question today is a pretty simple one. It's when should you trim back lilacs? And, and again, we get the same questions over and over. How do you trim your hydrangeas and how do you trim your lilacs? And it, it's really quite simple. You trim after they bloom. So as soon as they're done blooming, you let them be beautiful and do their thing. And as soon as the flowers dry up, you trim them back. And you can, you can trim them back a little harder than most plants, but you can at least trim back the flower and shape it to how you want. And occasionally you'll get another rebloom uh, if you do that, just like a spirea will do the same thing. You can trim it back, may flush out and bloom again, but otherwise it'll be nice and lush and a big full plant. And that's a great time to do it. You can get away a little bit later in the summer as well, but almost any plant trimming after the flower is a good idea. That's just a good general rule to use. Boy, those were really great pictures. It makes me... It's hard to take a bad lilac it, picture, oh, though. You, you almost want to grab your camera gorgeous. when they're in full bloom. It's, and it's the ones plant. that have the best fragrance, that's the ones I like the yeah. best. Yeah. Well, folks, we have no phone calls yet, so if you want to give us a call, uh, we would be happy to hear from you. But uh, while we're waiting for your phone calls, let's go to a little Did You Know segment next. An ant can lift 10 to 20 times its own body weight. If a man weighed 180 pounds, 
he would have to lift 1,800 to 3,600 pounds to be as strong as an ant. Wow. That's almost like Shane. That's, That's really amazing. 1800 is my max. <laughs> or should I say can't? Uh -oh. I'll say both of you. There we go. You never know. It could no, be Marion and I together. Yeah, maybe possibly. together, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, say we're waiting for some phones, uh, some phone callers. So if you want to call us, 217-333-3495. Well, let's go back to you, Kent. And okay. do you have uh, something to yes. tell us about? Yes. Um, we do a lot of different woody branches, and in the winter time, um, I go around to the property as I'm harvesting a particular crop, and I notice these hanging from a lot of the shrubbery that we use. Uh, this is our euonymus branches or burning bushes, and hanging on these are the capsules of praying mantis. Uh, in the fall, uh, before they die, they will go ahead and lay these egg cases is actually what they are. And in the springtime, usually about the first part of May, end of April, uh, when the temperature reaches a certain daytime temperature, they'll start to break out the little baby mantises. And this type of size here, you're probably looking at closer to 50, maybe perhaps are in there, and a few less than the smaller ones. I've had them almost up to about two inches in diameter. They're just huge, wow. some of them. And so what I do in the wintertime now is go around and collect them, and then I will go ahead and put them in areas where we're gonna do particular uh, cut flower crops that might be a little more susceptible to aphids, uh, white flies, things like that. So uh, the praying mantis are a predatory uh, insect. They're one of the good ones you need to have in your garden. And uh, you can also buy these from uh, companies that deal strictly with beneficials. Um, but if so you look around, I would think most gardens would have them. Yes. You just have to be aware. Mm -hmm. You have to kind of know what you're looking for. Are, exactly. Right. Great thing to have yeah. yeah, some of them will be a little longer. They, they, right. they have a different shape on, mm -hmm. the, on the trunk as well. But we collect them and throw them mm -hmm. in the greenhouse. Yeah. So we have Absolutely. an overwinter greenhouse all winter. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they come out a lot earlier because we keep it at 55. Longer, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's a perfect beneficial because yeah. they get in there. And they're, Absolutely. They're a great looking little insect. Well, yeah, that's one awesome. year along the east side of my house, they had just hatched out. Mm -hmm. and. Oh, they were so cute, and there were probably right. 50 of them up on two sides of, yeah. the, of my house. They and are really cute when they're young. <laughs> but they can be a little bit intense with yeah. each yes. other. Yes, so they, 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 they um, sometimes will have a tendency to be warlike. weed out the, <laughs> the yeah. smaller ones. <laughs> yeah, the weak but, anyway, but yeah. you can move them around. Yeah. I think that's a great yeah. idea, like yeah. you were saying, when you're trimming back. Yeah, it's not like yeah. a baby bird. If you touch it, the mom right. will come back. You can yeah. pick them up and throw them anywhere. That's right. Yep. Well, we're going to come to you eventually, Marianne, but okay. we do have some phone calls, and we'd like to go to you folks next. Let's go to line two and see what Carolyn's question is about cuttings. Hi, Carolyn. Hello. I have a question. I have a large impatient plant, a large geranium plant, and I would like to know uh, how to take cuttings from those and get them transplanted so I can successfully use them this summer in, the, in pots. And then I would also like to know uh, a little bit about seeding lettuce in, in some kind of container so I can take uh, little cuttings off of it and eat as salad. Okay. Let's do the cuttings first, geranium and patience. Yeah, the geraniums are very easy. Um, I don't put them in water, but just a little bit of soil in a geranium cutting, will it will root quite easy, keeping the top moist and the bottom in, in soil. Not too wet, but uh, a little bit of moisture in the soil. So those are really easy to do um, if you just do cuttings on the geraniums. People can get fancy and do the leaf cuttings and get mm -hmm. hundreds from a leaf, but it takes a little bit more expertise. But just a general cutting in some soil goes a long way in a geranium. The impatience I struggle with, I don't know if you guys have any, it's I too no moist them. of a stem, mm -hmm. I can never mm -hmm. do cutting. So I collect the seed from the flower. The, the flower has a little seed in the middle that you can take off when it dries, yeah. it, it grows really easy. Matter of fact, if you have impatience, you'll probably have them around the ground below a pot. 
because mm -hmm. they seed pretty easy. So I'm a, I collect the seeds from the impatience, although I'm too lazy. I just buy the seeds. It's much easier than <laughs> collecting it. Uh, I don't I don't ever take that. The geraniums I'll do cuttings on sometimes. And was there anything else as far and as? And then the last yeah. thing was about seeding to have lettuce. Mm -hmm. That's lettuce. What a great, great idea. That's a great time of year to, to start thinking about lettuce. It germinates very quickly. It's very easy to grow. It's a cool weather crop. Um, you can do them in containers, um, maybe even in your garage if you have a nice window, a nice bright window to do them in. But if you have one of, um, uh, uh, oh, what I'm even thinking of, a, a window, a um, storm window or something that you're discarding, you can use that to create a little lean-to or greenhouse outdoors, keep your soil a little bit warmer, um, have that closed underneath the snow and cold, and start sowing lettuce. Probably right now, I'll mm -hmm. bet you could start getting a little bit of germination. We've had enough sun that you could probably get some good germination. And if it's but not warm enough, it'll just wait. That's yeah. exactly mm -hmm. right. It's yeah. not going to die. Where the window, a lot of people have basements and you have a window well. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can, and they have plastic covers. So you, you actually open the window, seat it outside there, and it's usually warm enough to just do it outside mm -hmm. your window this time of year. Yeah, like, like having a little greenhouse. Yeah, a little greenhouse, totally? but and you can escape for a fire in, in yeah. your greenhouse. <laughs> Same place. <In> your greenhouse. <laughs> <laughs> so then once they get up, you like you were saying, then you would want to clip those and add them yeah. to salads or when you have enough, make your own salad. So that would be fun. And don't forget spinach as well. Yeah. A hint for you about mm -hmm. spinach is you must keep the seeds cool. The minute those seeds get warm, they will not germinate. And I learned that from Chuck Voigt, who does that for a living. The so guy that sings? Yeah, the guy okay. that sings about vegetables. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, well, thank you very much for your questions, Carolyn. Let's go to Jill's questions next, and she's on line four. And it looks like you have something to ask us about tulips. Hi, Jill. Yeah. Hello. Uh, yes, um, my main goal is my daughter gets married the end of May, and mm -hmm. we're hoping for some fresh tulips but we're not banking on it, um, this is a time, you know, a timing thing. But besides right. forcing bulbs, tulip bulbs, can you just plant them, let's say, you know, February in regular pots and they'll bloom two months later or grow two months later or whatever? Well, if you have waited till now to plant tulips, it's very possible those tulip bulbs have used up all of their uh, reserve food source. Uh, they really should have been planted in the fall. But if you have still got some now, and if they have no weight or substance, they have used up their resources. So um, unless they feel like they are large enough and heavy enough, you could put them in, but you still need to give them a cold treatment and then you really are going to miss May. Um, they usually yeah. need an eight to ten week yes. cold period. period. And yeah, if you start planting them now or a little bit later, you're just not going to get enough cold for but, them. But I will say, uh, if you you can go online and check, there are companies. I just got an email yesterday that they were selling bulbs that have been cold, kept in a pre cooler, pre-treated mm -hmm. for especially for that. Right. Exactly. But uh, you probably know better than any timing for a wedding yeah. is <laughs> it's <laughs> brutal. Yeah. It, you never get it right. Mother Nature never seems to agree well, with it. Well, at the university, we always try to time for graduation. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's always <laughs> 10 days early. It'll be a week. Yeah. But for the end of May, usually those are lily flower tulips and the parrot tulips. Those are the late ones. Yeah. And usually those are even a little bit done before the end of May. But this year yeah. being a little warmer and no snow, mm -hmm. and yeah. like earlier. even in the ground, people will see it different. But as far as a pot, mm -hmm. it'll be tough to find. But there are bulbs out there. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody offered me 500, a, a crate of 500 uh, for 10 cents a piece. They had been in a cooler. If I'd have known what to do, if you want 500, you can call me. Okay. <laughs> I can do that. But uh, other than that, it's tough to get. Support your local florist <laughs> too, true. because tulips yes. are available year round. That is true. They can get you some very good deals. You can maybe have grown a few, and then the other 200 <laughs> you can get yeah. from a florist. But they're gorgeous. We I get them most of the weeks through the spring for my students' classes, and they're beautiful. And you do just work ahead with your florist, or if you can find one that will be willing to yeah. order for you. But mm -hmm. they just a little bit of time ahead would make all the difference mm -hmm. for them to be able to get stuff in. Okay. Well, we enjoyed the tulip question. Thank you very much, Jill. Now let's go to Gene's question, and he's on line three, or she, um, and on, with the question about peach trees. Hi there, Gene. Hi. And what my is your problem, question? Well, my problem is I got three peach trees, and 
And, you know, I, I prune them after they bloom, you know, and everything. And then I, then I take them, uh, after they grow, what happens is, is I get rot on them. They're, they're rotten. And then do they drop? Rot. Huh? They rot and then drop? No, well, they, what they, they, they did get about half ripe, and just before they get ripe, they all get rot on them. And then they, you know, they're no good, as far as mm-hmm. I'm concerned. They, and all three of them are doing. I got a white and two Albertas. Does anyone feel comfortable answering peach tree questions? Not rot. I, I don't know a problem like that. There's a, plenty of problems with peaches, but I, I, I don't know. It sounds like a fungal issue maybe, but who knows. Yeah. I'm not I'm not really, really sure. Yeah, I'm more of a leaf guy. You yeah. get the leaf curl and all that, but as far as a fruit, I'm not. Uh, I will have to see if um, prof- Professor Skirvin possibly, uh, maybe even Chuck Voigt, but we'll have to check with them about rot and then drop. And it's different kinds of peaches. So... Rather than guessing, I think we're going to wait and say, yeah. let me find out, because yeah. that is not our specialty here. But thank yeah. you so much, Gene, for your question, and we'll see if we can find out for you. That sounds like an intriguing question. Now let's go to Gloria's question about orchids, and she's on line six. Hi, Gloria. Hi, how are you? Great. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing pretty good. I recently went back to growing orchids, and uh, years ago I used to have an orchid, would bloom in my kitchen window. It had yellow flowers that looked like dancing ladies, mm. and they smelt like chocolate. They were, and I cannot for the life of me remember what they were called. The one that comes to mind as far as being a yellow blossom would be the Oncinium. That's what I was thinking. Is it, does it smell like chocolate? Um, I don't know. I've had somebody ask for chocolate orchids before. And, so I bet that's what it is. Yeah, and the common name is dancing lady. Okay. And That's what came to my mind, yeah. but I wasn't sure about There's the smell. There's another one that is yellow with kind of a chocolate color, and it does have a chocolate fragrance. Oh. But it's, okay. it's, I'm not sure on the exact family of orchid, which what it is. Well, we're going to give you the Oncidium to start mm-hmm. with. That's O-N-C-I-D-I-U-M, yeah. Oncidium orchid. But if you can find the chocolate orchid, right. I mean, it's actually called that, isn't it? Uh, it's one of the... Yeah, it has a little more open blossom Okay. where the petals are coming But it's down. yellowish also. Yeah, it has some yellow with it. Nice. So that's worth looking into. But I thought, with Dancing Ladies, I thought yeah. of Oncidiums. Yeah. So hopefully you can track that down, Gloria. And good luck with your orchid growing. That sounds like a lot of fun, actually. Well, we're going to do one more question, then we're going to have uh, you do your email, Marianne. So let's go to Rick's question on line five about maples. Hi, Rick. How you doing tonight? Doing great. Great. Uh, I got a 20 foot tall maple tree in front of my house at the boulevard, and the roots are coming up under the sidewalk and they're breaking my sidewalk up. And I can't really mow in my front yard because the roots are getting so big and popping up. Uh, is that going to kill the tree or anything if I cut them roots, or what? What's the best thing to do? Okay, tree guy. Yeah, I mean, you can always cut some roots. I know people don't like to cut any roots, but the reality is there's a lot of, uh, on a 20-foot tree, there's a big root system. So, you know, for the sidewalk, absolutely, you can cut a root to, to uh, put the sidewalk on, but you're just not going to be able to do much when it comes to the entire yard. A lot of people will try and cover it with soil. All the roots are going to do is move up to that next level. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the beauty of owning a nice maple tree is you have to sacrifice a, a good lawn beneath that tree. So... I mulch it and eat, and I'll be honest with you, even by the mulch, planting perennials around the mulch, they will, the, the, it'll take every bit of moisture you give it. So giving it a nice water to keep this, keep the soil in the ground so it stays in the ground, the less you water, the more those roots will come to the surface looking for water. And it, I even had it so bad that I had a pot sitting 10 feet below the tree and the roots went into the pot and took all the water from the flowers that I planted in it. I couldn't believe the water the plants wouldn't stay alive, and that was because of the tree. So <laughs> you're not going to be able to cut all the roots. Whatever you cut, cut will be rejuvenated. But when it comes to a sidewalk, yes, absolutely, you can cut the roots and have a sidewalk and shouldn't have to worry about having it take up a sidewalk everywhere else. I, you're really going to have to live with, I believe. Okay. Enjoy the shade, because if you didn't have it, then you'd be complaining how much well, your, that's, your, that's uh, right. your that's good optimism. Cooling, your cooling bill was. 
Okay, thank you very much for that. Marianne, would you yes. like to do your email? I'd be delighted to. Um, this email is about Japanese lilac trees. The question is, I have a small four-year-old Japanese lilac tree in my yard. Is it all right to trim it into a more rounded shape? And when is the best time to do this? Also, this tree is not very leafy and only has a few blooms in early summer that do not last long. How can I promote more blooms and better leaf growth? I already have a local lawn care service feed and treat it four times per year. I love Japanese lilacs, Syringa reticulata, beautiful trees and they always bloom white. I don't know of any other color that they bloom, but mm -hmm. um, fragrances are wonderful. Um, just a, a lovely tree and they're fabulous street trees. I've seen them um, grown on boulevards in, in the communities before and they, they tolerate so much. So they're a great tree to have around. Their natural form, um, concerning the, the pruning, can you prune it to a more rounded shape? They naturally grow in kind of an oval to rounded form. So. Um, I kind of think pruning them when they're only four years old is, is probably not necessary. You could, but if you're going to prune it, um, like Shane said earlier, pruning um, right after they flower is probably the better thing. Otherwise, you're sacrificing some of the flowers. And Japanese uh, tree lilacs have a tendency to bloom heavily every other year, um, usually mm. in between, but not always. So um, if you're, ha you're having them bloom at four years, I have one that didn't start blooming until it was seven or eight years old. So you're... I think you're really lucky, but they, they typically, do, typically do do bloom early. Um, and, and I think um, having somebody treat it four times a year is maybe a little bit excessive for something that young. Um, newly planted trees and shrubs, I usually recommend just a, a treatment of uh, compost. You can never go wrong with compost. Uh, top dressing something that, that is that age, top dressing around the root zone, and mulching well is probably all it needs. Very good. Wow, flowering at four years old, I wouldn't mess with success. No, absolutely, I that wouldn't sounds either. Great. And, and certainly, if they prune it, you're probably sacrificing some of the flowers. Mm -hmm. And this so. year was maybe the best blooming year in the oh. history of it. It was, you didn't totally realize this was. entire studio is surrounded it's by them. It's gorgeous. It was, uh, it, yeah. just really pretty. You saw that all over the community. Yeah, we didn't realize here. how many yeah. were in our community yes, until, exactly. You're exactly yeah, until right. that happened. Yes. Yeah. Wow, that sounds great. So I'm glad that hers is flowering early. Yeah, all totally. right, Shane. What's yours? All right, so I'll, <coughs> I'll give a little synopsis. Uh, our, uh, somebody had written in and said that their uh, quince was blooming at an unusual time, that it was blooming when it's not normally, mm -hmm. it's a lot earlier. And her daffodils do the same thing, and they're worried about uh, the freezing rain in the winter for the winter, uh, or freezing rain in the winter killing the plants because they're out too early. And well, I, I always tell everybody, welcome to Mother Nature. This is how <laughs> the world works. Um, every year when you think you know exactly what's going on with your plant, something different happens and that's, you just have to enjoy it. There's, uh, as I tell my 16 year old daughter, there's some things you just can't control so you can't worry about it. When your plants come up and they wanna come up, um, they are. The seasons change, sometimes our soil temperatures are a little warmer, the plants are a little fooled. Um, there, again, there's not a lot you can do about it, especially when you have hundreds and hundreds of daffodils like our, like our uh, viewer did. There's, you just have to enjoy that and accept the fact that some things are going to bloom at different times. Um, it, sometimes you get two blooms, so nobody ever complains about when their iris come and bloom a second time in, in the fall. Right. And mm -hmm. so your daffodils, it sounds like some are going to bloom early and some are going to bloom late. But I, again, it's, it, I always tell people you, you can't worry about something that comes out and is pretty early. Just enjoy it. Yes, that was what I was going to say. Say hooray. Yeah, say and hooray. Enjoy it. Take a picture in the middle of winter. That's right. Well, let's try to slip in Ellen's questions about uh, about oxalis on line seven. Hi, Ellen. Hello. Uh, one of my favorite plants is the burgundy colored oxalis. Oh, I agree. And uh, I have it in a pot outside, and then when it turns cooler, I bring it inside. And it was doing just fine for many, well, I would say five years. Brought it in this time, and maybe it got a little nipped, I thought, because the leaves started getting very speckled with, you know, like fade-out spots and then kind of curling up on the petals. And it, even the new sprouts now are coming in that way. And I just wondered, what is causing this mottled kind of diseased-looking leaf? Do you think it is disease? I've never had anything happen to my burgundy oxalis. I've actually had that very thing Have happen. Have you? What to is it? it? Yeah, it looks like a, um, 
a fungal growth on okay. the leaf. And honestly, I've just pulled it off and, and discarded that, that part of the plant and flushes out right again. Just fabulous. But if you think it's really infected with something, I would actually just turn the soil out and break up the, the, the colony of pips and start spreading it out into um, another container, maybe changing the soil just to, to move it on to something else. They are so easy and they, you just rip them off and they flush out again. They're, they're fabulous plants and, and that purple. And next year, divide some of yours out and put them in the lawn, you know, in your oh, flower fun. beds yes. and then in pots as well. And it, it was just gorgeous. So try to make yeah. sure you have two pots next year when you bring them in. Yeah. You know, then you always have some that look great. And so. I just have to, we have them in our greenhouses uh, in big hanging baskets. And I just have oh. to watch the water mm -hmm. because I, I either let them get really dry or I overdo it. And that's when I get the fungus problems is okay. I, I water them too much. And then it drips from the greenhouses yes. and makes them even more moist. Exactly. So uh, that's something you have to watch. Overwatering will cause some of those problems as well. I think we love Burgundy Oxalis. <laughs> this is what we've learned today. Yeah. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week gardening. See you next time. Bye-bye.